The year 2000 computer problem is a, a problem that really affects computers in terms of how they interpret dates. And uh, about 40 years ago, when computer programmers were first beginning to, to program these large-scale mainframe computers, uh, storage space was very expensive and extremely limited. So one of the simple things that they did uh, to save storage was to lop off the first uh, two digits in the year portion of a date. So 1963 became 63, 1974 became 74, and so forth. The problem is that when you get to the year 2000, the computer stores that as 00, assumes that it's preceded by the digits 19 and interprets the date as the year 1900. And so when we roll over from 99 to 2000 to 00, the computers of the world will collectively read that as 1900 and they'll have a collective nervous breakdown. They'll, they'll go blitzo. What it really means is that computers in general will not handle the calendar changeover correctly unless they've been checked and programmed appropriately. People ask, uh, how in the world could they have done this and not had the foresight to really see this problem coming? And the reason for that was that none of these guys programming these computers 30 and 40 years ago thought in their wildest imagination that these programs would still be functional and operational uh, going into the next century. The real tragedy of the Y2K is that for several decades nobody was listening. And now that they wake up to it, the last few years they've been working hard. But if you go through the arithmetic, you realize that there are not enough people, in the, uh, trained people in the world, to uh, correct the problem. In addition to the untold billions of lines of computer code around the world that must be painstakingly reprogrammed and tested, there is the more ominous problem of the embedded chip, where the code cannot be reprogrammed. The thing that is uh, the most insidious about the Millennium Bug is what's called the embedded chip system problem where the code is actually burned on to the chip. These chips are very inaccessible. Some of them are in satellites. Some of them are at the bottom of the North Sea regulating the flow of petroleum. They're in appliances, devices, weapon systems, all kinds of systems worldwide. There's about 25 billion of these. The good news is that less than 5% of them are date sensitive and will encounter any problem with the Millennium Bug. Uh, the bad news is that every single one of them has to be checked in order to make sure that they're not gonna be uh, impacted by the Y2K problem. You don't reprogram an embedded chip, you replace it with a soldering gun. And the problem is, is that these are inaccessible. They're in satellites, they're buried in pipelines, they're under the ocean floor. And uh, they have to be replaced one at a time. You can't automate this process. So the embedded chip problem is the one that most boardrooms are panicked about. Because they know they will not be able to find and test and fix all of them. They're just hoping the ones that they don't find won't sink their companies. Of primary concern is our nation's electrical power grid. Many leading experts fear that due to the lack of readiness of major power companies, electricity may be lost in some regions of the country, possibly even on a nationwide basis. If the electrical system, for example, does not survive the Millennium Bug, and if we can't generate uh, consistent, stable uh, electricity, then everything else in our society, like a domino, falls from that. Uh, a lot of people believe the power grid could go down for weeks or even months at a time as a result of Y2K. We saw this in Auckland, New Zealand in the first four months of 1998 when the power grid went down for four months uh, and about 25 percent of the companies in central Auckland went bankrupt. It was interesting that Senator Bob Bennett and Senator Christopher Dodd, who co-chair the Senate Special Committee on the Year 2000 Technology Challenge, when they first held public hearings in Washington about the Year 2000 problem, the very first thing they started with was the state of readiness of the electrical power grids. During those hearings which took place in June of 1998, it was learned that of the 10 largest utility companies in the country, not one had even begun repairing any of their systems. That prompted Senator Bennett to uh, say in a press release uh, following these public hearings that if Y2K were tomorrow, we would of a certainty lose 100% of the electrical power grid. And for anyone that's uh, been through a power failure in the middle of January, that's a very frightening prospect to think about losing heat and electricity and refrigeration. And again, all the things which we as consumers depend upon for our modern way of life. The biggest exposure in the power grid sense is the northeastern part of the United States because of their dependence on nuclear power. The NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, has a commitment for safety, not for providing power. And there's a there's a lot of debate going on in the management circles as to whether or not they're going to shut down all or most of the uh, nuclear plants because they're highly dependent on support systems. The plants themselves might be all right, but for example, if you lose 911 service, you've got to shut the plant down. 
and it takes five months to bring it back up. Perhaps the scariest thing is that it takes only 10 to 15 percent of power plants to lose power in order for the entire national power grid to go down. And because embedded systems are so difficult to find, this is a very real possibility. Should electrical systems fail, the flow of water to our homes will also be interrupted, since electricity is required for the purification and delivery process. This could lead not only to the lack of drinking water, but create massive problems as well with sewage and waste disposal. Our entire society is dependent on chemical processing. Our water is processed before it's delivered to our homes. We have sewage plants. There are other chemical plants. There are oil refineries. All of these depend on embedded chips, depend on pure power. Surprisingly, many of them depend on the global positioning satellite. Our electrical grid across the United States is dependent on the GPS, and the ground stations are not yet compliant. They hope to be in time, but we'll see. Perhaps the most concern to many people is the whole banking institutions, uh, the electronic dependency of our banks, our insurance companies, our ATM units, and so forth. They're all interconnected. The problem here is, is that you can spend effort and get your system Y2K compliant, your database Y2K compliant, but if you interact electronically with a database that's non-compliant, the non-compliant database can contaminate yours. You know, the modern banking system is uh, very fragile. And when I was researching the Millennium Bug, one of the things that I wanted to know was of all the deposits on record in American banks, my money and your money sitting in a bank somewhere, how much of that is actual currency that you could withdraw and actually put in your hands if you had to? What I found out was that only 1.6% of all the deposits on record is actually in currency. The rest of it, 98.4% of it, is nothing more than a digital entry on a computer. Furthermore, uh, the large banks, the money center banks in New York, may get their act together in time. It'll be a photo finish, but they may. But the small regional banks don't have the resources, so they're worried about that. But the biggest problem is international finance. Between one and three trillion dollars per day is transferred over the elect international electronic networks. And the foreign banks and the foreign governments are much further behind than the United States. And so one of the concerns in the global economy is the uh, laggards in uh, other countries that we interact with and we're dependent upon. The federal government owns 25% of all the computers in the United States. They are running woefully behind in getting their computers ready for the year 2000 challenge. In fact, 13 out of 24 key federal government agencies, including the Defense Department, the Treasury Department, Transportation Department, will not complete their year 2000 computer repairs until well after January the 1st, 2000. All the government agencies, federal, state, municipal, are all dependent on large-scale computers. And the major government agencies are perhaps the most laggard in uh, preparing for Y2K. There are some agencies that have been working on this for over 10 years, but most of them are uh, just starting uh, recently. We can certainly expect a lot of glossing over to be done by government official spokesmen, and that's, that started already. We've already had a great deal of uh, not to worry sort of statements, and uh, that's, uh, I, I don't think, helpful because it uh, may make some people uh, fail to realize how urgent the problem really is and how much attention needs to be devoted to it. The Social Security Administration was one of the few government agencies to address the Y2K problem in a timely fashion. Beginning in 1989, they discovered they had more than 30 million lines of code that needed repair and began the painstakingly slow process. Their progress prompted President Clinton to make the following statement during his State of the Union speech in January of 1999. We also must be ready for the 21st century from its very first moment by solving the so-called Y2K computer problem. Now, <laughs> we had one member of Congress stand up and applaud. And we may have about that ratio out there applauding at home in front of their television sets. But remember, this is a big, big problem. And we've been working hard on it we already. We've made sure that the Social Security checks will come on time. And I... We've been told again, uh, and we hope it's true, that Social Security is in pretty good shape. 
because again an awful lot of people are dependent on receiving those checks at the proper address at the proper date and in the proper amount and that's all done by computer one of the largest computer operations in the world and that has a lot of these embedded chips it's an old system uh, and uh, so that uh, if there's any hitches there people will notice it very quickly President Clinton has indicated the Social Security Administration is Y2K compliant. Uh, they've had 3,000 people working 10 years on this. They worked nine years and got 41% of the job done. In the last two years, presumably, they apparently have gotten the rest. That all sounds pretty good. The problem is the Social Security Administration doesn't print the checks. The Treasury does. And the Treasury is not compliant. There are other federal government agencies that got started much later and have much bigger problems. For example, the IRS has about 100 million lines of code didn't even begin the process until late 1995. The Defense Department, perhaps uh, the biggest problem of all, has at last count over a billion lines of computer code. They didn't get started working on the problem until late 1995. The government was very late in starting. Uh, they have now uh, reported that they have a substantial degree of, of uh, compliance, uh, revisions of the systems. Uh, I think they're a little optimistic in their reports. Uh, most of the government reports are tinged with a lot of optimism to make sure everybody understands that everything is being nicely handled. My understanding is the Department of Defense will not be ready till about the year 2005. Perhaps a, a biggest concern to many of us is the Department of Defense because their mission critical systems are not compliant and they're working hard to try to make them. They're having working hard just to define them first of all. There are many many uh, old systems uh, with the embedded chips and these are the things that are going to cause the most trouble because these have to be fixed manually. Uh, there's no software or anything you can do to fix an embedded chip and uh, so that uh, means that uh, you need a very large number of personnel. Uh, I would think that we'll be lucky to have everything settled by the year 2005 in defense and uh, that's worrisome. And they're also concerned because both China and Russia are even further behind. There's actual negotiations going on to have observers of the various countries participate in each of the command posts so that there won't be any false alarms and that sort of thing. As long as there's no crises and nobody uh, uh, has hostile intentions uh, against us, uh, why uh, we will probably not notice too much of it. But there, there's a lot of hostility out there. A recent investigation by the Inspector General's office found that the Defense Department had been lying in its reports regarding their state of Y2K readiness. The Pentagon's Defense Special Weapons Agency, which oversees our arsenal of nuclear weapons, agreed with the Inspector General's findings and reluctantly admitted that they had indeed falsified their reports. The uh, government coordinator and the government uh, publicity offices are very anxious to make sure that everybody gets a proper political impression of how confident the administration is. And that's why you have to take everything with uh, not only several grains of salt, but discount about uh, a great deal of it. And in the Department of Defense, it's extremely important. These systems govern a great many things uh, uh, that involve weapon systems, uh, readiness, uh, communications throughout the world, things of that kind. And uh, so I think that uh, we're going to have more trouble than the government uh, optimistic statements indicate. I think the Inspector General is probably closer to the truth. The possibility of breakdowns on traffic signals and that sort of thing uh, could very well occur, but be relatively minor in contrast to our major backbone in this country, which of course are airlines and railroads and so forth. The railroads are not compliant. You no longer throw a switch day manually. It's done by embedded chips and computers. Getting to the airlines, the airlines even have a bigger problem because Lloyd's of London has indicated that unless they show progress, they're going to pull the insurance. There are a number of airlines that have already announced that they will not be flying over the New Year's holiday until they can let things sort out. The interdependency of manufacturing in this country is uh, one of my biggest concerns regarding the impact of Y2K on employment and uh, our economy. There are going to be serious problems. There are going to be some companies that haven't done it early enough and are going to have a great deal of difficulty and not going to be able to fund the, uh, the, the repairs. And they will inevitably go out of business. General Motors has 600,000 pieces of equipment with embedded chips in them. Let's assume they check all those and get their act together and they work fine. That doesn't solve their problem because each assembly plant has 10,000 vendors. And these are small companies that may not have the resources for Y2K. Food processing, as well as all our chemical processing, is highly dependent on very complex technical processes, which in turn are dependent upon embedded chips as well as computer management. And all of these things uh, 
uh, can be in jeopardy. Now, another aspect of the food chain is not just the processing. Check any community that's had a flood, a tornado, or a hurricane, or a, say civil unrest, and the stores are stripped in a matter of hours. And so if we have disruptions in our supply network of food, the, the problem of getting adequate food supplies, especially to the urban areas, is going to be very serious. We have a, a system that is highly dependent on computers, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, the, uh, the delivery of health services. Uh, what happens if I'm on a, uh, a respirator at midnight and one of the computer chips goes down? They've already tested this, and they find the respirator just stops. Uh, so uh, happy new year and goodbye world. Should the phone lines go down for any length of time, police, fire, and rescue services would also be greatly affected. Uh, there are still a lot of people who are in denial uh, and don't really uh, want to devote l large amount of resources that are necessary to this. It's unbudgeted. It, it's a very unhappy expenditure because it, it, it does nothing whatever except put you back where you thought you were. The Gartner Group, which is the foremost research group on the year 2000 computer problem, says that it's going to cost $600 billion worldwide to solve the millennium bug. $300 billion of that in the U.S. alone. Then they estimate that on top of that, there'll be a trillion dollars worth of civil litigation uh, that flows from unresolved Y2K uh, problems. Overall cost has been estimated only once or twice. It's uh, in the neighborhood of between 600 and 800 billion dollars. Uh, the precision of that estimate uh, tells you a little bit about how accurate it is. Uh, I don't think anybody knows. Even that estimate didn't include a great deal of the uh, non-public uh, activities, that is to say the non-governmental work, the things that individual companies themselves are going to have to do. The real problem isn't just computers. The real problem is the economic impact of all of this, and not just fixing it, but the disruption that will probably occur in major sectors of the world economy, not just here in the United States. Dr. Edward Yardini, who is one of the foremost uh, Wall Street economists, often cited in Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, USA Today, and others, has said that uh, he basically thinks that there's going to be a 70% probability of a deep global recession flowing from the millennium bug. In his most recent reports, he uh, dramatizes that the entire world is on the threshold of major deflation. We're not used to a deflationary scenario. But it does mean that the rule books go out of the window, that we may be facing massive contraction of economies around the globe, massive unemployment, um, and uh, uh, one in which reducing interest rates, which is the usual tool of the central banks, won't remedy. The good news for Americans is that uh, we are leading the pack internationally is in terms of addressing the Y2K problem. The bad news is that we live in a very global, interconnected economy where it's not enough to just be ready in this country or in any other country because all the countries impact one another. Japan, the last report I saw, only about 5% of their computers are really ready to meet the year 2000 challenge. And of course, we are very dependent upon them economically. If they don't make it, it is going to have a severe adverse impact on our way of life here in the States. The entire world financial system is in serious jeopardy anyway. We have a meltdown in Asia. Russia is in meltdown. The European banks are far in far more jeopardy than the general public is aware. When long-term capital went into bankruptcy, Alan Greenspan testified before the Congress that if we didn't inject $3.8 billion into that situation, that the world economic uh, structure would collapse. Now, that's not an alarmist writing a newsletter. That's Alan Greenspan, and not an offhand comment in his testimony to the United States Congress. What that tells you is, that, is how fragile our financial, our global financial system is. Now, this is all independent of Y2K. If you put Y2K on top of that, the probability of a major economic collapse is very, very high. What America is facing is basically an economic monetary decline, a, a social political decline, and a spiritual moral decline. In many ways, our country is in a free fall. The great majority of Americans are, are very apathetic and complacent as to the things we're talking about here today. Uh, they are not prepared for these. They believe that the good times are going to roll forever, that the stock market and their stock portfolios and retirement portfolios will go up forever. Uh, we think that there's going to be a great uh, surprise, 
uh, and that the uh, 75 million plus Americans that make up the middle class who have got the lion's share of their retirement funds, their set life savings in the most overpriced stock market in, in world history uh, are going to probably uh, be relieved of many of their assets. The spectrum of, of uh, possibilities is, uh, uh, runs the whole gamut. There are many today even that still believe it'll be a minor glitch, a little bump in the road that you'll hardly notice, and let's hope they're right. But uh, I fear they're, they're in error. There are others that are at the other extreme that think it's uh, doomsday, the end of Western civilization as we know it. Obviously, most uh, competent authorities lie between those two extremes. Some feel it'll be uh, uh, brownouts, not that serious. There was a fear for a while, may still be held in some quarters of a national blackout. The question is, how long will it be for a few hours or a few weeks? Um, but I think the truth of the matter is, nobody knows how serious it's going to be. One of the real problems here is that nobody knows very much about it. They know what the size of the problem is. A lot of people don't know if the fixes they are doing are going to work. And almost every fix which involves a complete revision of a system needs to be tested and run through several times. And as it develops bugs, which is inevitable, then those have to be fixed. So uh, when you speak of a fix, you're not speaking of a one-day operation where somebody goes down and tinkers with an old chip. Uh, you, you're, you're talking about a fairly long-term process. The brownout scenario I see largely lasting, if it comes to pass, from a couple of weeks to a couple of months. It's largely a scenario of inconvenience and frustration. Uh, you might imagine what it would be like to live in rural Russia or rural Mexico today, where the phones work sometimes and sometimes they don't. The electricity works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. But it's largely a scenario that we can muddle through and get through to the other side with certainly an economic recession or worse, but we survive it and get through it. The uh, next worst scenario is what I call the blackout scenario. If we lose the electrical power grid, then everything falls like dominoes from that uh, particular linchpin. So, for example, we lose not only electricity, but we lose refrigeration, we lose transportation, we lose trucking, we lose the modern food distribution system, and uh, we create a scenario that is going to be not only fear and uh, perhaps panic and frustration and a lot of social chaos as a result of it. I see that lasting anywhere from a couple of months to even a couple of years. Certainly, getting the power back on in this society will be a high priority, but if you think about it, without the power, you can't even keep the computers up to continue working on the problem to solve the Millennium Bug. So power certainly is a very crucial element uh, in, in our future as a country. The third scenario I talk about, and this is the scenario that I pray daily doesn't come to pass, but it's what I call the meltdown scenario. This scenario is not unlike the blackout scenario technologically, but what it says is that there is so much uh, social unrest, political instability, and chaos flowing from the loss of electrical power that uh, all bets are off and anything is possible, anything from anarchy to tyranny. And again, I don't think this is going to come to pass, but we need to realize that the social and moral context today is vastly different from what it was, say, in the Great Depression where people didn't have decades of social Darwinism leading up to that event, where there were still community values and spiritual values and people helped one another and they worked together to get through this. My concern is that if uh, recent events are any indication, things like the LA riots or the blackout in New York and other uh, catastrophes, uh, it's, it doesn't take long before people are only looking out for themselves and taking advantage of that kind of chaos to their own uh, good and to the detriment of their neighbor. Los Angeles has asked the city council for an additional four and a half million dollars for an additional 300 officers to be available over New Year's Eve and following uh, to, to provide uh, uh, help. They're worried about uh, looting and that sort of thing. Uh, the uh, Canadian military has been alerted uh, by their prime minister to, be, to uh, avail themselves to the cities. The Navy is uh, going to ports to provide generators, that sort of thing. The National Guard in Wisconsin has been alerted that they will be activated. Perhaps the most chilling aspect of the impending Y2K crisis is President Clinton's executive order number 12919. This executive order effectively allows all assets of the citizens of the United States to be subject to seizure and control by the government in the event of a Y2K related crisis. My biggest fear is not technical. My biggest fear isn't even economic, although it's substantial. My biggest fear is political exploitation. Whether the crisis is real or imagined, it provides a, a, an incredible opportunity for a grab for power to institute uh, the executive orders, which will give us the equivalent of martial law. 
and uh, a further incursion on the freedoms that we've taken for granted in our American heritage. One can only speculate as to the severity of the problems that will be created by Y2K. However, there are a number of prudent steps that can be taken in order to best prepare and reduce the impact. You know, the truth is, with regard to the Millennium Bug, consumers have very little influence over whether the federal government gets its computers repaired or whether private industry gets its computers repaired, but that doesn't mean you have to become a victim. It does mean you have to become proactive, you have to take some initiative, and you have to engage in what I call emergency preparedness, a little old-fashioned emergency preparedness. Unfortunately, that's a very different mindset for most of us modern Americans because uh, we have bought into what I call the myth of continuity that today is going to be pretty much like yesterday and tomorrow is going to be pretty much like uh, today and life is going to march forward uninterrupted progressing more abundance and all the rest but if you know anything about history you know that life is periodically disrupted by things that are beyond our control and things that we didn't plan on and in a very real sense the Y2K problem is uh, kind of the mother of all uh, unplanned for events among the simple things we can do uh, to prepare for this is first of all have good good records if there's going to be confusion in our in our banking systems our financial systems uh, then the least you can do is have hard copy records of your brokerage statements your bank statements all your financial and legal documents should be kept current do good housekeeping keep on this so in case there's confusion you can prove where you stood on a certain day they need to secure hard copies of important documents things like birth certificates marriage certificates uh, property owned deeds of trust and all the rest loan statements, credit card statements. Last thing you want to do is in the spring of 2000 be in a dispute with the IRS or with a major mortgage holder over how much money you owe them. And one of the ways to circumvent that process and uh, make sure that you don't become a victim is to have a hard copy of that data so that you can prove to the appropriate people what you owe or what you own. Another thing that's really important for consumers to do is to begin now to stockpile uh, food and water. I know this may sound radical to a lot of people. If you live in a coastal city and you've ever prepared for a hurricane, you know what I'm talking about. It's not radical, particularly when you consider the fact that the modern grocery store turns its entire food inventory over three times a week. That there is only 18 days worth of food in the food distribution system, period. And so it only makes sense if we think that that food distribution system may be disrupted or interrupted for some reason, particularly as it relates to the year 2000 computer problem, that we stockpile some basic foodstuffs now, household goods and all the rest. But a simple way to do this is simply to throw uh, a few extra uh, cans of canned food in your grocery cart when you go shopping. That way you can do it uh, baby step fashion, a little bit at a time, incrementally, and begin to build up some stockpiles of food. Many people who are expecting the disruptions from Y2K to be long term have begun storing prepackaged foods which are designed to have long shelf lives. Nitrogen packed foods can last upwards of four years or longer and usually require very little preparation. Water is another thing that people need to prepare for. One of the things is if we lose electricity and even if we don't our water system may be disrupted. We take for granted the fact that we can go to the tap turn on clean water, we can drink it without fear that we're going to be contaminated or we're going to receive some kind of disease or something. But uh, one thing my family's doing is that when we empty out those two liter Coke bottles, we rinse them out, fill them back up with tap water, put four drops of Clorox in them and then store them in a cool dark place. It'll keep indefinitely and it's a good way to make sure that in the event that your water is disrupted, you've got a supply of it. Should the fallout from Y2K prove to be long term, the storage of large amounts of water may prove to be difficult. However, a number of products are currently available which can safely purify water for drinking purposes without electricity. Various energy alternatives also exist for those who are unable to function for an extended period without electrical power. Many have begun installing various solar and wind-powered systems for their homes and businesses, while others continue to purchase gasoline and diesel power generators at a rapid pace. As you start looking at your family situation, everyone's situation is different, but having a, 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 some extra supplies, some extra, uh, that we can do several days without food, we can't do very long without water. Consider ways to store, have a reserve of water, a reserve of food, and basic household necessities in case there is confusion in the log logistic supply to our stores and our communities. I think this is a time to take a good look at medical supplies uh, from just a first aid level or if you have special dependencies, make sure that you've got uh, resources there. 
if I thought the lights were going out at midnight on the year 2000 and I was living in a high-rise apartment building in New York City uh, where the elevators might stop, the lights go out, the traffic lights in the streets are gone, suddenly there's no water, suddenly there's no sewer, and this lasts for three days. It lasts for three weeks. If you're in a situation where you're dependent on controlled substances, it's very important to talk to your doctor about your sources of supply and what you might do to have a reserve of a month or two if it's storable, if you can, if you can accommodate that. In Watertown, New York, it lasted for 30 days. Uh, in January of 1998 when an ice storm took down their power system. Uh, what would I do? What things would I need? Would I need blankets? Would I need candles? Would I need warm jackets? Uh, would I need protection? What kind of things uh, would I need if this happened for a week or two weeks or two months or whatever? I think people need to be thinking uh, in those terms. The suggestion of having ready cash on hand is good advice, but it, does, it will put a strain on our currency. The Federal Reserve has uh, got the presses working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, trying to print enough currency to meet the anticipated demand. Uh, and that, uh, they're increasing by only 14%. So if all of us take only 14% more cash out of the system, it won't be a problem. If you try to do more than that, there's going to be uh, bank runs on currency. There may be even legislation against it. I think it's uh, too early to pull all your money out of the bank. I don't recommend that. But I do recommend that people begin to prepare an emergency cash reserve. And if they have the wealth and if they have the ability, they may want to also diversify into things like uh, silver and gold or real estate, assets that historically have transcended crises after crises and uh, been of value on the other side of a crisis. It's also an important time to uh, get together as a community, through our churches, through our families, through our communities, to band together because many of these uh, preparations can best be done collectively rather than individually. Ordinary citizens across the country who are concerned about Y2K's impact on their own communities continue to organize local town hall meetings like this one held in Hemet, California. In many cases, churches are taking the leadership role by bringing together local representatives of the police and fire departments, banking institutions, public utilities, and the medical profession. The purpose is to spread Y2K awareness, to assess their own community's state of readiness, to help citizens prepare, and to avoid last-minute panic. Being prepared for a natural disaster is very, very important. But I'll tell you, the biggest danger that we have isn't the Y2K problem. It really isn't. That's not the problem. The biggest problem that we can have is if we, as a nation, panic. If we panic, this movie wants to get people's attention, but I hope that the don't panic message comes through. We don't need to necessarily build a bunker in the woods to survive this thing. I think that the way that we're going to get through this is by neighbors helping neighbors, working together in small communities. What's interesting about preparing for Y2K, there's nothing that you would be doing that you shouldn't be doing anyway, because there's other threats, floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, civil unrest for other reasons. We do have a responsibility for the people around us, and uh, therefore we're going to have to begin to plan, build awareness, and organize if we're going to get through this. If we're going to get through it, we're going to do it by working together. This is an incredible opportunity for churches to prepare themselves to minister to people who will be confused, people who will be in need, people that may need just the basic necessities. There is a community in Michigan where a church in Michigan has committed itself and is providing themselves with enough resources to take care of the entire town. What a fabulous witness. If Y2K never happens, that town knows how much they're loved. I think there's no excuse for us to sit back and, and uh, just hope for the best. It's a time to roll up our sleeves and show the community that we can put shoe leather to our faith and that we can provide for those that uh, uh, will prove to be ill-prepared when the time comes. If you're a Christian, I believe that as you consider the year 2000 computer problem, you really have four responsibilities. Number one, you have the responsibility to trust. God is still on the throne. He's still sovereign. This has not caught him by surprise. And therefore, we can be confident that he's going to work all things together for our good to those of us who love him and are called according to his purpose, as Romans 8.28 says. Secondly, we have a responsibility to repent. You know, if there's any God that reigns supreme in the modern pantheon of gods, it's the God of science and technology. And the incarnation of that God is the computer. And could it be that God is dashing that idol on the stones of our complacency and waking us up to the fact that we must de be dependent upon the living God who has promised to provide all things for us, not mere machines, but the living God. 
third responsibility we have as Christians is the responsibility to prepare. Um, if we don't provide for our own family, the scripture says that we're worse than an infidel. And I believe that our uh, preparation and our responsibility to prepare is certainly hierarchical. We need to prepare not only for our immediate family, but then also for our neighbors, for those who are the household of faith, and then those for, that we encounter upon the, the road of life as well. And then the fourth thing we need to do is we have the responsibility to share. And as Christians, this is what sh separates us from uh, mere survivalists. We're not caught up in the uh, heresy or the false belief of individualism. God's called us together in covenant communities. We're in relationship with other people, and we have a responsibility for those other people. I know of churches organized in all over the country to meet the Y2K challenge, and basically their attitude is that they're gonna encourage their members to prepare for themselves, but beyond that, to prepare for those who either don't have the means or the foresight to prepare for themselves. Noah was warned before the flood, and you can go through the whole scripture. God never leaves his people without a warning, but, but God does call us to stewardship. There's a verse in the book of Proverbs that's so important it occurs twice in the identically the same form. The prudent see trouble coming and take action. The simple keep going and suffer for it. Hello, my name is Pat Matriciano. I'm the founder and president of Jeremiah Films. For over 20 years now, we've been producing documentary films similar to the one that you've just seen. During the last two decades, we've not shied away from presenting the truth in our films, regardless of how politically incorrect our message may be. In many cases, we've been able to provide pertinent information to the public well in advance to the national media. My hope is that you will take the message of this film to heart and prepare yourself and your loved ones for the upcoming Y2K crisis. Of course, food and water are essential for survival and therefore are considered to be of utmost importance in preparing for Y2K. Planting and growing food is one option many Americans have begun looking into. However, for those interested in prepackaged foods, I highly recommend ready or not emergency food supplies. These easy to prepare gourmet nitrogen packed meals are guaranteed to last for years. When it comes to water purification, the Seychelles system is recognized by the Red Cross and the U.S. Coast Guard as an effective method of removing unwanted particles and toxins from drinking water. After having done extensive research for Y2K, I strongly recommend these products for their high quality and excellent value. These are products my family and I have chosen for our Y2K preparation. To order any of these products, I invite you to call the toll-free number, which is appearing on your screen. <laughs>